Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! This happened about a week ago, so this was fairly recent. For background purposes, I'm a senior in high school, 17 to 18 years old. One of my classes I'm taking is a scientific research-based class where you are given five months to look at academic research, determine a problem or a potential innovation that hasn't been explored, and design an experiment based on it. We would carry out the experiment and present our methods, data, conclusions, and next steps at a regional and state science fair. If our project was good enough, we would qualify for the Intel Science and Engineering Fair, ISEF, which is a massive pre-college scientific research event. If you want to feel completely inferior in your knowledge about anything, that's the number one place to be. All of these science fairs had scholarships, money, and places in ISEF for the taking. Since the class was a combination of a four-year pathway, we had all grown pretty close with each other, despite having vastly different friend groups and interests. We held an impromptu Thanksgiving feast, secret Santa, a Valentine's Day, loosely planned on our own time and money through Snapchat. By the beginning of March, we're all starting out putting everything together on a trifle poster. We all spent a decently unhealthy amount of time stressing about our experiments and posters. Coming out of it, though, all of our projects look great, with some of the materials and the experiments done being absolutely insane. To give a couple of non-identifying examples, one project was about detecting hypercardiomyopathy through AI in a portable ultrasound machine, and another one was about pH levels and their effects on growth of compounds in tomatoes. By that mid-March period, we had one person not turn in anything. For reference, we will call her Megan. Megan did not do anything up until the beginning of March, and then she just kinda magically pulled a poster out of her A. We all just kinda ignored this, and we were mainly focused on getting our speech and presentation down because we were going in front of judges. Cue the day of the regional science fair, or basically the combination of everything we've done. We're all presenting our projects in front of a judge assigned to us. Despite spitting all over my judge, because I cannot do public speaking for my life, I get pretty good marks myself. Not enough to be a finalist per se, but nice enough. By the time lunch is completed, seven projects have been deemed as finalists, one of them being Megan's. Another girl from our class, who we will call Carly, also qualified. Her project was on metal nitrates and their effect on powering nano devices. This is where the open secret spills out amongst our group that Megan had faked her data and the consent forms that invoked the use of human subjects. Basically, her project was illegitimate. We decided to let it play out in the hopes that the group of professional judges would not see her project worthy of any awards. Megan ended up winning a $1,000 scholarship to a local community college and all the expenses trip to ISEF. I don't have any clue how she got past the finalist round, but apparently one of the judges said her project was impressively statistically significant. She completely isolated herself from the entire group immediately, preferring to hang out with her boyfriend who helped her fake the project as well. Naturally, considering she stole money and ISEF trip from Carly and God knows who else, there were 300 students attending. We were all absolutely pissed. An understatement, by the way. And almost stopped mentioning it. Up until this kid who we will call Spencer created another group chat adding everyone except for Megan. We were going back and forth for about three hours on what to do and how to inform our teacher who had no clue about the entire situation. Megan's downfall was herself. She bragged to her friend Marisa about faking the data. The signatures on the consent forms were apparently fake and could be verified as so. This is legal, so just don't do it. She had not taken any other notes to illustrate. She had actually done the experiment. Heck, 
she hadn't turned in a single thing related to the project. All it took to unravel the entire thing was for someone to tell our teacher. And that's exactly what happened. We had a group of people tell our teacher that next morning. It was either then or ISEF. Or they have a, an entire day dedicated to project clearance. I was gone for a tennis tournament that day, but apparently the environment in our class was very tense as everything was starting to unravel. Q Monday. I walk in and it appears Megan is gone that day. Our teacher tells us that Megan was disqualified from all the awards and the ISEF placement was given to Carly. While we were never given the full details, it appeared that Megan's project was deemed illegitimate by the entire science department and our principals who looked over both Megan and Carly's projects and notes. So I am now writing this after the state science fair. We had all put the drama behind us and had a fantastic weekend. I myself got a first place ribbon and a nice trophy for my own category, along with several others for their own categories. We also had someone qualify for a bunch of scholarships and a trip to an environmental conference. A few more got other awards. Overall, a hell of a good experience. We welcome Megan back to class tomorrow and all I'm hoping for is that she learned her lesson. But I'm not gonna bank on it. I was working a job that had me operating in one of our offices overseas. We would have business expenses and those receipts would be in the language of the country we were in, obviously. Those expenses were for things like print, ink, office equipment, cleaning services, marketing costs, all pretty standard stuff. Well, around this time, we got a new VP over our region who worked out of his office in LA. This VP came up with this brilliant idea to hire a translator to translate all of the receipts to make sure we weren't sneaking in bull crap. Fair enough. However, the issue that arose was that we had to send our expenses to the translator who would translate the receipt, then submit for reimbursement. The problem was this translator was a real caring type. She would demand better scans of the receipts. Often after we had already thrown it away, she would argue if we really got the best deal or whatever we bought. I remember in one transaction on about $200 of ink cartridges, she asked me why I didn't order online from this common website, to which I said they were out of stock at the time and we needed the ink so we bought from a local store, to which she said I was spending too much money. To which I said, it's none of her concern, your job is to translate the receipt. To which she said, if I want her to submit my expenses, I need to be nice to her. To which I said, she needs to learn her place, she's a translator, not a VB, that gets to instruct me what to do. After this encounter, she started being extra anal with my expenses. So, one day I came in the office early to call her and try to work things out. She basically told me that I screwed up by pissing her off and she expected my expense reports to be perfect or she wouldn't submit them unless they were. I told her if she keeps this up, she won't have a job much longer. She laughed and wished me well and hung up. A few months later, we had our annual meeting in LA and after the meeting, we were at a bar and I walked up to our VB and started up a conversation. I steered the conversation to expenses and I asked him how much in monthly expenses did he typically reimburse us for in the country we worked out of. He said about $3,000 to $4,000. I acted surprised and asked, is that all? He goes, yeah. To clarify that three to $4,000 is a typical spend and he says, yeah, it rarely gets above $4,000. So I asked him about how Karen, our translator, is doing. And he says she's doing a good job and I nod my head and I go, how much fraudulent expenses has she got? It's important to note every employee that was submitting expenses was well paid. They will be awfully stupid trying to skim some extra dollars via fraudulent expense report. He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, you hired her to ensure all the expenses you were reimbursing us for are legitimate, right? Her job is to translate them for you, correct? He says it is. And I ask, so is it safe to presume you've done that to ensure people aren't submitting BS expenses? And he says, you could say that. I smile and ask, so how much fraudulent expenses has she caught? He thinks for a moment and goes, 
I don't think she has got any. So I ask, and how much do we pay her? He says it depends on her workload, but between $2,500 to $3,000 a month. I smile and ask, does it make sense to pay someone $3,000 a month to translate $3,000 in receipts? Well, she ensures we aren't getting fraudulent expenses. And I counter, well, you said she hasn't caught any in the last nine months. And the expenses are always between $3,000 to $4,000. So as long as the expenses stay in that range, wouldn't it be safe to assume that the expenses are legitimate? And couldn't you bring on a translator on a contract basis if they get out of hand? He sees my point. And imagine the cost of savings. We will probably save over $40,000 a year. That's a good chunk of change, isn't it? The VB tries to defend his position, but she does a good job. And I counter, but you could frame this as you've saved us $40,000 a year and created the baseline to judge expenses by. Cutting costs is always good for the bottom line and the end of the year bonuses, isn't it? For your information, I knew that a major percentage of a VB comp package was the company had to do with the company's margin at the end of the year. The bigger the margin, the bigger the bonus. You can see the twinkle in his eyes. We carry on the rest of the night and a few weeks later, we get an email from the VB saying, we are to submit all our expenses directly to the admin for reimbursement and that we have let go of Karen. FYI, Karen wasn't her real name, obviously. But good riddance nonetheless. This is what I get for going to the store instead of ordering groceries to be delivered. So with the corona stuff going on, I've been dutifully staying in my apartment, like a decent human being, and limiting any time I spend outside. Unfortunately, this has been hell on my partner's mental health and the depression is real. So I decided screw it. We're both food boys and he likes cookies. There is a giant the next block over. So I get dressed, put on my sweet Disney mask, go on Etsy, the designs are wonderful, and head out to get my partner some cookies. Now for reference, my style is hobo chick. So sweats, sneaks, graphic tee, and a hoodie. Keep that in mind. I go into giant and head for the cookie aisle. I am considering if I want to do Oreos or if I want to be fancy and get Pepper Ridge Farm. These are the important questions of life. When an older woman who is very short asks if I can grab something for her off the top shelf. Of course, I said yes because she was nice enough to ask. I'm a simple guy. I hand her the item and go back to my contemplation. As I decide to get them both, I hear the hum <laughs> hum. I've worked retail and I've worked in food services. So I know the sound of a wild Karen when I hear one. What's up? I ask. What's up? Is that how you treat? I have zero in the way of spoons and even less patience. Ma'am, ma'am, I'm gonna need you to look at me and try that line of thinking again. Who the hell? Hey, 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 hey. Uh-uh. Let me tell you what you're not gonna do. I need you to whoa, whoa, and chill. I know you know better. Karen still looks mad but doesn't say anything. I tell her, now I can help you find an employee if you want. But what you will not do is yell at me. I am only here to get cookies. I point to my stomach. I'm a thick boy. Not that I need them. Karen cracks a small smile. Gotcha. But at this point, I'm committed to this. I didn't choose thick life, it chose me. Karen starts to crack and laughs a little before all of a sudden starts to tear up. I'm 6 feet, 300 pounds, and black. A crying Karen is a bit detrimental to my continued freedom. Um, you okay? I ask her. Yeah, it's just that this is the first time I've laughed in a while. My husband is in the hospital. The virus? Yeah. I'm not sure if it means much coming from some cookie guy, but I hope he recovers. Karen smiled and walked away. While she didn't apologize for popping off, I'm glad it didn't escalate further. Her husband's condition doesn't excuse what I'm sure would have been an awful tirade, but it does serve as a reminder that crab is bad for everyone. It's me again, Mr. Waterboy. I work for a water company carrying out repairs on burst water mains on an on-call basis of one week every two months. This particular job happened about eight years ago. We got a call out that a major pipe feeding a large housing estate 
that first needed repairs ASAP. We head to the yard about 11 p.m. at night to collect our gear and get the plans and drawings of other utilities in the area of the work. We arrive on site, set up the traffic management as per regulations, speak with the inspector that called us out for an exact location of repair, too much water to mark in the usual way, and we set up our barriers and work lights around the working area. We get out our steel saw and cut a couple of meters of tar out ready to start breaking the tar out of the road. Just as I started the jackhammer going, Mr. Sleepyhead came stomping down the street in his slippers and dressing gown looking rather perplexed. Took my ear protection off to see what he wanted. I could tell it wasn't to offer us a coffee. He then proceeded to tell me you can't shut that thing off and F off until it's daytime. I explained that it was emergency work and that we couldn't have 600 properties get up and have no water in the morning, so it has to be completed now. And our work was fully understood by the council and the police. We then get the usual bollocks of, do you know who I am? I refrained from telling him that I knew exactly who he was. He's an irritated jerk who was stopping us from working. He then starts turning the air supply off so I can't use a jackhammer, which was ever so slightly annoying. He then said that he knew the police chief inspector and would have me arrested if I carried on. I said that I have to carry on as per my emergency work order. If he carried on obstructing us, I'd have to call the police to get the job finished. Needless to say, he did it again and said, Call who you like, I'll have you arrested and sacked by morning. By now, I was tired, cold and wet and starting to get slightly irritated by his actions. So cue malicious compliance. I go back to the van and ring the police to explain that we are out carrying out emergency work and we are being prevented from completing it by one of the local residents and explain what he's doing to stop us working. He stomps off in his now soggy slippers and I pour a coffee. About 40 minutes later, headlights appear in a distance, so I thought, great. Just what we need so we can get done and recharged by 6 a.m., hopefully. Mr. Sergeant and Mr. Constable arrive and come for a chat to find out what the hell is going on and his words, why the hell are we doing it after midnight in the first place? So I proceeded to explain that the water main had burst and we needed to get the supply restored by 6 a.m. to save between 1,500 to 2,000 only slight exaggeration people having no water in the morning. When they get up. He then realized a job needed to be done and toddles off for a word with Mr. Sleepyhead. Before long, we can hear the shouting from down the street. It then goes quiet and he comes back down to us to explain that the guy was a sandwich short of a picnic, a British euphemism for a nut job, and that they are going to have to hang around in case Mr. Sleepyhead starts playing stupid games. So we fire up the compressor and start jackhammering again with my back towards the police car to save anything pinging off in that direction. A few minutes later, the machine driver toots his horn to get my attention. Mr. Sleepyhead had only come down the road carrying a piece of timber. Plumber for you American folks. I was in the process of getting arrested for disturbing the peace. I honestly laughed so hard I nearly pissed myself. Who the hell is that stupid when the police are around? Just in case anyone is interested, we were back on by 5.30 a.m., and had a coffee off Mr. Sleepyhead's neighbor, who was highly amused because he'd seen the whole incident out of his window. His only disappointment was his surveillance cameras didn't pick up the video, and he only had the audio to share with his mates. Malicious compliance is that he told me to call the police and he'd have me arrested, but gets himself locked up instead. This was in 2017, but I'm just now learning of this subreddit. Context. I'm a black teenage girl and when these comments happened, I had turned 15 not even a week prior. I had a suicide attempt September 2017 and was admitted to a psych ward. For anyone who doesn't know, psych wards are crabby at best and a living hell at worst. When you come in, they do a medical exam to make sure you aren't harmed, drugs and so on. I tried to hang myself and because of that I had visible bruising around my neck that needed to be examined. So they sent me to the inward doctor. I was nervous and obviously in a bad space, so I tried to just go along with it and not do anything crazy. Just a quick in and out. He started looking over me and said, Is this a bruising from your attempt? 
And I said, on my neck? He rolled his eyes and was like, no, the bruising on your foot. What do you think I'm talking about? I decided to just let it go and ignore it. He then started asking me about who I was and when he asked what I wanted to be when I grew up. I said that I wanted to be an ER doctor because how fascinating medicine was and still is to me. He looked at me dumbfounded, rolled his eyes again and said, please, inward girls cannot handle the sight of blood. I was in complete shock and didn't respond. He went on a spiel about how I would never make it as a doctor and how I should give up on that dream. I stayed silent until the exam was done and ran out and started bawling. It hurt me so much and I was extremely broken up. That was my only hope and dream and it had just been shattered. About a day later I asked to take a survey about my say. I had been there about three days and I was like sure, whatever. The nurses and everyone else I had met was amazing and treated me like a human, not a patient. I sat in front of the computer and took the survey. I am given five stars saying how the food is decent except for some stray bit of plastic and so on. Then it asks me about the doctor. You already know what went down. I did what I do best and wrote about the experience and how awful it was. About three hours later a nurse calls me out and leads me to this room. Inside there are three people who introduce me as the directors of the adolescent mental health program. They said they had some concerns about my review, so I went ahead and told them everything. They were shocked and apologized about the experience and said he would be dealt with. About two days later a bag of Panera bagels was sent in. I got two cinnamon crunch bagels, my old time favorite. And I never saw the doctor again and found out he had been fired. This is a story of Mike. Mike managed the warehouse of a hospital. Said the hospital was built in the 50s in the center of the town. The stadium is on one side, the justice hall on another, and schools on a third side. There is also a concern and two other medical buildings around. So the streets are crowded with cars searching for parking. One day, when opening the gate to the landing dock, Mike noticed a little car parked in the hospital internal court near the 2,000-liter liquid oxygen tank. That model of tank. Of course, it's absolutely forbidden because this is a private property. The court has been planned before 35T truck was a norm and maneuvering is already difficult and liquid oxygen is explosive. A car or a truck hitting the tank will be a major hazard. It was a small Italian car. No advertisement, but it was a con commonly used as a second car or travel in the Dolomite Mountains where the roads are very narrow. So Mike makes some calls. Uh, the car is not owned by someone from the warehouse or the nursing staff. No doctor has such a small car and a reception made public announcements asking visitors to make the badly parked car to no avail. By 18 hours, by 6 p.m., the car is gone. Okay, problem solved. Uh, the day after, the car is still there. Same cause was the same result. Mike called the police, but the police cannot make it towed because it's a private place. And towing companies won't do it without a police query. By chance, that day only lorries came to unload medical materials. When it's time to close the warehouse, the car is gone once more. On the third day, when a landing dock opened, the car was already there. And now, that is a real problem. A 35D truck from Germany must come today. There is no way it can reach the dock without tilting the car and a liquid oxygen tank. It has become a clear and present problem of security. All the warehouse team exchanged ideas on what to do, but all feasible solutions have already been tried. It's when someone from the maintenance team passed on a forklift with a pallet of plaster bags. It struck everyone at the same time. There is no way the Italian car could weigh more than one ton of plaster. So Mike goes to see the forklift driver while the team searches for a wood pallet. Slowly, with many precautions, the forklift slided the pallet under the car, lifted the hole, and dropped the car off the nearby street. In the first 10 minutes, the police are warned that a car is parked in the middle of the street blocking the traffic. The said car is towed away in less than half an hour. The truck had no problem maneuvering. Two days later, rumors ran through the hospital. It was a car of the director's wife. She worked in a medical building some streets away. 
While everybody found that Mike made a good move, they waited to see what would follow. It's now a global problem of management. Mike is called to the direction, and as soon as he passed the door, he starts to explain. Yes, I know it's your wife's car, but... The director went, what? No, I called you for an entirely other matter. I warned my wife several times. She had it coming. That's the word. Until the hospital closed 20 years later, the story has been repeated to each new worker and each medical student. Put your car on a tree if you want. But don't park it in the landing dock court, because Mike will make it disappear. So here is a story that might as well have come straight out of an episode of the world's most entitled people. And there ever was one. It all started on a seemingly average Tuesday, the kind of day you'd forget about the moment your head hits the billow. Except this one turned into a tale I'll probably be telling at every family gathering for the next decade. I live in this quaint little neighborhood where everyone knows each other, or at least pretends to, and where the homeowners association rules are treated like sacred texts. Our HOA president, let's call her Karen, takes her job more seriously than a secret service agent. Now, I've always been cool with Karen. I mean, sure, she's a bit overzealous with the HOA regulations, but we've never had a problem. Until that fateful day. You see, I had this habit of parking my car on a street right in front of my house. It wasn't a big deal, the street's public property, and I was planning to take my car out again later that day. No harm, no foul, right? Well, not according to Karen. That afternoon, my brother-in-law, Chris, was over. Now, Chris is a police sergeant, the kind of guy who's seen it all and then some. We were in the living room catching up over a couple of beers when we heard this loud bang from outside. It sounded like a firecracker went off next to our front door, and we both jumped up and ran to the window. But we couldn't see anything from there. So, we decided to investigate. As we opened the front door, the scene before us was like something out of a bad comedy. There was Karen standing next to my car with a machete in her hand. Yes, you read that right, a machete. And one of my car tires, the one she just slashed, was slowly deflating with a dramatic hiss. The tire didn't just quietly accept its fate, though. It put up a fight and exploded, which was the bang we heard. Chris and I were in shock for a split second before he sprang into action. Police! Drop the weapon, he shouted. All while Karen stood there frozen looking like a deer caught in headlights. It was only when she realized who had caught her in the act that her expression changed from surprise to something akin to horror. But he was breaking the rules. Karen stammered trying to justify her actions. She pointed at my car with a hand that wasn't holding the machete as if it was the most offending object she'd ever laid eyes on. Chris wasn't having any of it. He just committed vandalism and assaulted private property with a deadly weapon. I'm arresting you, he said to her. He took the machete from her, carefully of course, and handcuffed her right there on the spot. Meanwhile, I was still trying to process the insanity of the situation. Chris called for backup, but within minutes a couple of patrol cars arrived to take Karen away. The neighbors were peeking out of their windows and doors, whispering and shooting curious glances our way. It was quite the neighborhood spectacle. In the aftermath, we pressed charges against Karen for vandalism and for the assault on private property. The court case was relatively straightforward given the clear evidence and the fact that a police sergeant witnessed the whole ordeal. Karen ended up having to pay restitution for the damage to my car, along with an extra hefty sum for her reckless behavior. But that wasn't all. The HOA held a special meeting and decided to remove her from her position as president. I guess even they thought she went too far this time. The incident became the talk of the town, or at least our neighborhood for weeks. People couldn't believe Karen, the HOA president, had gone off the deep end like that. As for me, I got my car fixed, and yes, I still park in front of my house from time to time. But now, I make sure to check outside every so often, just in case another entitled person decides to take the law into their own hands. And Chris, well, he's become something of a legend in our family. Every time he comes over, we joke about putting him on neighborhood watch duty. As for Karen, well, I hope wherever she is, she's learned that sometimes it's just not worth it to get so wound up over small things. After all, it's just barking. 
This was in my 11th grade high school. My computer class had a year-long substitute teacher because our amazing teacher was out for a year working on a government contract. Our previous teacher was outstanding. He had six different classes in our classroom, all happening at the same time, which were computer repair, programming level 1, programming level 2, networking level 1, networking level 2A, and level 2B. He would give a lecture for each of the classes on a specific day of the week, programming on Monday, repair on Tuesday, and so on. We would all work in our own groups and everything went quite well. The next year came around and I found out that we had a sub for the year. I had two back-to-back -back blocks in this class because I was doing two courses. I wandered up to the class to see what kind of teacher we were dealing with, mainly interested because I was almost certain whoever they found did not have the credentials to teach at least half of those classes. The new teacher was a foreign woman that none of us have ever heard of before. For the purpose of the story, we will call her Mrs. S. I went and found my friends to tell them what I had seen. We were all optimistic because from a very short conversation she seemed quite informed and had a good background. It didn't last long though. On the first day of class, Mrs. S. introduced herself as a programming teacher who had been in school for four years. She went on to tell us about her programming experience in Microsoft Excel and Microsoft Access. She then told us that the programming students would not be doing the Java and C++ course we had signed up for and would instead be doing database and Excel because those are what she learned and she said, and I quote, they will be more useful than C and the Java. She also went on to suspend all at lunch clubs because she didn't think high school students could be trusted with computers alone. Understandably, some of us were quite upset about that considering that we came there to program. She also did not give the repair people or the networking people any kind of support and completely stopped her lectures as well, preferring to let them figure it out themselves and self-teach without giving any of the resources to do so and occasionally throwing out a test pre-written by the last teacher for her. This continued for about two weeks till one day she came in and said quite irritatedly that we would actually be doing the Java now unless we wanted to keep doing databases. So we switched to Java and she basically left us out to dry from there. Because she wasn't teaching database anymore, she came to harass people in computer repair. First, she told us the shop room was too messy and made us throw out 90% of our training workstations and equipment because they were not important in her eyes. Equipment that did not belong to the school but actually belonged to the other teacher. We took home what we could steal for safekeeping but she did end up throwing out a few thousand in equipment. Then she started imposing stupid rules on us, such as you can't have a computer on while you're troubleshooting inside cause you could electrocute yourself. Or you don't need the case open to troubleshoot motherboard lights. Or my personal favorite and the most scary, maybe you should change the power supply to 240 volts if you aren't getting enough power. We followed most of her stupid requests as much as we could because she threatened to lock us out of the lab room and give us only textbook work if we didn't. Needless to say, it was a challenging time. One of the students in the networking area got fed up and started doing his own coursework and lecturing to us so that we could at least get some kind of use as of the courses. To his credit, it was all very good, but Mrs. S had the boss to force him into doing it from there on out and then turn around and give him low grades for not getting his own work done on time. A few months of this very uneasy balance go by and my mother comes down with colon cancer. I have already had a handful of other family members suddenly taken from me by cancer, so understandably this is a very stressful time for me. I was joking with my friends and trying not to break down over the whole thing I had a very unstable laptop running Linux that would crash if it looked funny and had a horrible habit of corrupting the operating system when the battery died because a reserve shutdown sensor didn't work anymore. Battery always read 0% but would go for an hour or two. While I was working on a school desktop computer, I had a few pages open that I was taking notes in and a Facebook tab so I could keep in contact with my mother because she was in surgery and I was waiting for her to come out. I looked over and the teacher is snooping through my laptop opening folders 
and closing windows and eventually pushes the power button until it shuts down, which also usually corrupts anything I was doing. And the following happened. What the hell do you think you're doing? I told her. You shouldn't be on Facebook or writing notes on a personal computer during class time, especially when your grades are slipping. Thanks for bringing that up in front of everyone. Well, that gives you no right to touch my stuff. You better hope you didn't just corrupt everything. This laptop breaks easily. Then you shouldn't have it out during class. Also, keep that tone up and I'll see you get a detention. At this point, I'm trying just to keep calm because if I get too emotional, I have a tendency to explode. This is often made worse because of my mild autism and I took a second reply in a calmer tone. I'm sorry, I'm just having a hard time at home right now. My mother was diagnosed with colon cancer and I'm waiting to hear back. And this is a part which really set me off. You don't look like a kid whose mother has cancer. Quit making sob story excuses. Are you kidding me? It took every fiber of my body not to stand up and slap that witch right there. I gave her the dirtiest salon yard stare I think I have ever done, while also trying to not burst out crying. I spoke to nobody for the rest of the day till I got home. People kept asking if I was okay and I ignored everyone. My mother was out of the hospital and home by the time I got there. I broke down crying and told her about my day. Her face was comforting but you could see the fire of an angry woman behind her brown eyes. She told me not to worry and that it would be okay. A few weeks passed and I was called into the office for a one-on-one parent-teacher conference someone forgot to tell me about. There were all the teachers I had that year, good and bad, my learning assistant teacher, the VB, and the principal herself. He told me that we were there to discuss my grade slippage as soon as my mother came. My mother was about 10 minutes late, leaving me to awkwardly sit with all these people, and she comes in and is all smiles. Sorry I'm late. I got held late at the hospital. Someone, but I'm not sure who, asked her why she was at the hospital and if everything is okay. My mother answered in her happy way, I was just getting my cancer checked on, because I have cancer. The room went cold and her voice seemingly dripped with blood when she said it. My computer's teacher went pale and everyone in the room was given a confused what on earth did you do look. My mother proceeded to relay me coming crying home about how I was treated to everyone present while Mrs. E tried to become one with the wall of a small meeting room. She kept it short, but to paraphrase, added the following. How dare you say something so careless to my son? I hope you are ashamed and I hope you don't get invited back for another year. She then returned back to her normal happy self and discussed my grades like nothing happened, whilst half the teachers were still trying to figure out what just happened and told them that now she was out of the hospital my grades should improve again. I just sat quiet the whole time and tried to suppress bursting out laughing. After that day, she never directly spoke to me again, had instructions relayed through other people or gave them to the class as a whole. She did her best to be nowhere near me and say nothing to me. My grades improved quite a bit and the year ended with me passing. Mrs. S was previously offered a job at the school as a secondary computer teacher, but after all the trouble, the job was pulled back. The next year, when our first computer teacher returned, he was furious to learn most of his equipment and personal books had been thrown out. We returned the things that we snagged during the purge, but he still lost a few thousand in personal teaching stuff. The school paid him back with 10 thousand, but he says he lost so much more than that in time and preset handmade equipment. We told him all about the horror show and he gave us all the extensive tests normally given at the end of the year, which the vast majority of us failed. We ended up redoing all the computer courses from the previous year because in his words, she didn't even teach us the basics. That sub can no longer teach in this or the neighboring districts.